Hello and welcome. I'm Keith Fox from Edinburgh, UK, and I'm delighted to be joined with, by two key experts, Barbara Cassidy from Oxford and Deepak Bhatt from all over the US. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you've got experience from the East and the West, and uh, now you're based in the East. So we need your insights and interpretations of some of the key trials and the key things that have been presented today. And um, uh, we know that Kentos was presented already at, at right. ESC, but there was an update. And this has maybe helped us in the field of precision medicine. So Deepak, tell us about this. So first of all, I think it's nice how you managed to get in there that it was presented first at ESC. Very, very well done. <laughs> um, but you're right, uh, the uh, really groundbreaking findings from Cantos came out there showing that an anti-inflammatory drug could reduce cardiovascular events. So mm -hmm. a, really a huge scientific contribution. What was presented here, I think, adds very meaningfully to that initial presentation, where now the Cantos investigators have shown that the reduction in CRP that occurs with administration of canakinumab predicts uh, efficacy, that is cardiovascular efficacy, so that patients who had a substantial reduction in CRP after receiving a dose were the ones that then had substantial reductions in ischemic events, including significant reductions in cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. So to me, it is a beautiful example of you know, personalizing medicine. And this is one particular approach, but maybe we should be doing more of this in cardiovascular medicine. That is not just putting everybody on every drug that a clinical trial shows is effective, but figuring out who it is that actually benefits using various biochemical parameters. In this case, it was CRP. So, so maybe we need, need to learn from the oncologists and others, you know, can we predict responders and non-responders? Well, that, that's certainly... Barbara, what do you think? Well, this, sub, this sub-analysis will be uh, also extended to the cancer uh, patients, to the cancer um, yes. uh, hypothesis, uh, and that is what Paul Ricker told me uh, yesterday. Uh, I don't think they are published as yet, mm -hmm. but uh, they showed it. And uh, the important point here is also to remember that this is a post-hoc analysis. Yes. And that uh, is not so much as the uh, response in terms of delta CRP that was analyzed here, but the uh, end CRP at three months. So the responders uh, were those who had a CRP below two at three months. Right. So you may argue that maybe those were those who had a lower CRP to start with, and so they were at lower risk already mm, and mm. maybe showed a bigger benefit. So the, all the disadvantages, if you like, and the caveats that there are in doing a, a, a post-hoc analysis uh, needs to be considered. I mean, mm -hmm, this is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very informative. This was pre-specified, yes. but it's still hypothesis generating but, rather but, than but Barbara, absolutely probing. To take one step back, you know, um, the IL-1 beta, the IL-6 pathway, mm -hmm. people have tried to attack this pathway in, mm. in the past. Mm. Why do you think this has worked? And others haven't. Well, uh, it, it, it goes down to patient selection. In other mm -hmm. words, this is not a free lunch, okay? Right. So, and that's why it's particularly important to have this uh, uh, further analysis because this is not a drug that is without complications. Yes. You know, you there is uh, an increase in sepsis. There is an increase in inf risk of infection. We know that also from mm -hmm. the rheumatoid mm -hmm. arthritis trials with this yes. uh, with these agents. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the risk is there, but if you have patients who have a very high risk uh, of cardiovascular events, then uh, and they have a good response, then you are more likely to uh, demonstrate the benefits uh, uh, and the uh, adverse effects uh, are relatively smaller. So a precise scalpel, Barbara, with yes. canakunumab, <laughs> The gamma or, knife of the or, gamma uh, Or yeah. the blunderbuss approach, <laughs> yeah. you know, which is being already in smaller studies done with cyclophosphamide. And there's going to be, obviously, the study also led by Paul Ridko with methotrexate. Yeah. And at least a couple of studies starting with colchicine yeah. as well. Large yes. right. studies. Yes. Yeah. yes, that's right. So, uh, so anti-inflammatory. Do you think that the, um, the, the broad approaches uh, with methotrexate, with... Um, 
Uh, I'm not particularly good at looking at the crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that uh, has after Cantus, uh, you know, one is started to think that this may well be, you know, further refined uh, rather than um, uh, okay. may well be important. Yeah. But an, another uh, weapon. Yeah. But, but yeah. your analogy actually I think is the perfect one. I mean is it a matter of being a sharpshooter or the yeah. blunderbuss? Yes. And, and if the answer is sharpshooter that tells us a lot that it really is specific pathways of inflammation not just generically inhibiting all pathways of inflammation. So that will instruct future study designs and study of future drugs as well in this space. But, but it tells us something really interesting about mechanisms. We all knew that inflammation was involved in, in atherogenesis. Yeah. Um, it's just that we didn't have tools that have really modified that and had no impact on LDL. We must remind people yes. that there was right. no impact yeah. on LDL. Yeah, no, no, that, that is very true. So, yeah. uh, so I think what we're all saying is, you know, here's a study that has opened up uh, the possibilities for future approaches, even if it isn't yet for clinical application. Is that it, fair? I, I think so, and it also shows the interrelatedness between different disease states. That is, there are also benefits here with respect to lung cancer, yes, with respect to gout. So yeah. these other diseases, at least in my brain, I sort of segmented and thought, oh, those aren't related, yeah. uh, other than some shared risk factors. But in general, that they aren't pathophysiolo uh, pathophysiologically related. Inflammation does seem to tie them together yeah. as well. Yeah. But oncogenesis takes a long time. Right. And yet these uh, pathways separated quite early. Now as, as, a, as a wearing your basic scientist hat, oh, Barbara. Not as an oncologist. <laughs> <laughs> Mercy. <laughs> Mercy. <laughs> so, you, you know, this is, this is tough to understand, isn't it? Yes, particularly as, uh, you know, inflammation and cancer go both ways. You yes. know, you yes. could enhance inflammation and, and uh, combat some type of cancer and, and some others. So even in some others, you, you get the, a beneficial effect by inhibiting. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, yeah. uh, quite a complex story, I think. Okay. So uh, let's park that for the moment. And let's sure. come on to something entirely different. Uh, and that's modifying risk factors. And Deepak, we're going to come to you on this. Um, this is a, a study presented today in terms of the impact of bariatric surgery. Right. Now, we know already that bariatric surgery has an impact uh, in terms of type 2 diabetes. Yes. So the key question uh, in the hypertension field is, does this modify hypertension? Right, so I thought a really well-designed, randomized trial. I've been a believer in bariatric surgery, having been involved with Stampede, where as you pointed out, that was where we first showed yes. that bariatric surgery in a randomized trial could eliminate diabetes. Mm -hmm. That is actually cure, mm -hmm. remission. Mm -hmm. uh, no need for medical therapy mm -hmm. for over a year in a substantial proportion of patients. And there, in that study, there was also a reduction in other cardiovascular medications, things mm -hmm. like uh, lipid-lowering therapy, antihypertensive, yeah. so signals already. Right. But there hadn't been a dedicated trial that took patients with hypertension, randomized them to bariatric surgery or not, to see if that might cure hypertension. And, and indeed, in this study, about half the patients were able to come off their medicines mm. for high blood pressure. And, and that was even with ambulatory monitoring. Mm. So, so exactly. it wasn't just office measurements. Mm. Yes, a rigorously done study. So. Yeah. To me, you know, that's really impressive. Now, of course, one could argue and say, oh, maybe you should stay on certain diabetes medicines and you don't want people coming off their statins and ACE inhibitors have other benefits other than blood pressure. So maybe coming off all your meds, you know, there, there may be a bit of a mixed bag there. But in general, I would say most patients would like to come off the ton of medicines that these patients with hypertension, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity tend to be on. So I think from a patient-centered perspective, it's a huge win. Yeah. And long-term? Well, you know, in, in terms of long-term and actual hard uh, outcomes, none of these studies, uh, wh whether it's older ones like Stampede or yeah. this one, Gateway, are powered to look at that. Mm. But one would presume if there is such good control of risk factors with great adherence, right? Here you're not saying take your statin every day. Yeah. You know, the LDL has gone down, the hemoglobin A1C has gone down, the blood pressure has gone down, the weight, of course, has gone down. You know, that sustained mm -hmm. degree of multi-risk factor reduction 
should translate into a reduction in cardiovascular events, but that would obviously take a very long, large study to so, prove. So, 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 Barbara, people are going to come to you and say, you know, I don't want to take all these pills. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I don't want it to uh, be labeled as a diabetic. Uh, let's just fix it. Let's have an operation. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I uh, tell my patients uh, all the time, there is uh, at least one millimeter of mercury for every point of BMI. This was uh, right. published uh, a few years ago in The Lancet. Mm -hmm. It's very clear that mm -hmm. there is a correlation. Um, so I think the main points here are really two. You know, you can, mm -hmm. by controlling your weight, uh, prevent a lot mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. this complication. Well, we knew that, but this really nails it. Yes. And two, what we thought was uh, irreversible is in fact reversible. reversible. So both uh, hypertension and uh, diabetes can be completely <laughs> cured. I, I mean, this that, is amazing. That, that is not what we were taught in med school. <laughs> no. Yeah? That's a really good point. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. So uh, I think that is, uh, and there is nothing else because, you know, if you give an antihypertensive agent, so your blood pressure goes down, you stop the antihypertensive agent, blood pressure goes up again. Whereas this is... Fantastic. So, so in the last few minutes, we must talk about the new hypertension guidelines. Right. So Deepak, um, you know, we've just moved, the guidelines have just moved 31 million people <laughs> to becoming hypertensive That's because right, of yeah. the 130-80 threshold. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid to go get my blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, there's also very interesting information about how this should be combined with atherosclerotic vascular risk. Yes. Maybe you could shed a bit of light on that. Sure. So basically for our viewers that aren't uh, familiar with it, uh, there is the 140 over 90, of course, that's anchored in most people's heads as a cutoff. But now 130 over 80 is also a cutoff for hypertension mm. if there is additional cardiovascular risk greater than or equal to 10% cardiovascular risk. Mm -hmm. Also patients with diabetes or, or uh, CKD uh, in most cases mm -hmm. would end up falling into that camp. So mm -hmm. really means a very large number of people who previously you know, weren't going to be branded as having hypertension now, would be branded as having hypertension and also the guidelines that imply should be treated yeah. with pharmacotherapy yes. as needed. So that's the real that's uh, the shift key. there. Yeah. And which I think will meet with some degree of controversy. I, I think it's reasonable and data driven and uh, mm -hmm. it just makes intuitive sense. But as you said, that means shifting a lot of people now who aren't on meth meds onto meds. Yes. And one of the points, Barbara, that they made was that by combining this with the atherosclerotic vascular risk, actually it narrowed a bit the population that would be treated. Do you think this is a sensible approach? I think that's a very sensible approach, but I am, uh, I don't like thresholds. Okay. So we know that there is... It's a continuous spectrum. Yeah. We know that there is a log linear relationship okay. between uh, uh, blood pressure levels and uh, events. And so it, it would be very, instead of changing the threshold every yes. so often, it would be so much easier to say you lower, if you have a patient at high risk, you lower the blood pressure as much as you can within, you know, yes. the patient tolerating yeah. the medication and trying to lower it as much as you can. Full stop. So maybe this is the key message, you know, <laughs> atherosclerotic vascular risk, yeah. that's the signal, lower all of the components yeah. that contribute to this. As we do for lipids. Well, we hope we do. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, we're, I was supposed to do okay. for lipids, yes. So, uh, Barbara Cassidy, Deepak Bhatt, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate your insights today here from Anaheim at the AHA. Thank you both very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.